And with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Rebecca, and uh, she can tell you about her exciting work with the Fiber Shed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, Fiber Shed is an organization that was really focused on what derives from our rangelands and pasture. And we were looking at it not from just a food perspective, but we were focused really on fiber. And this uh, started with a personal commitment that I made to map the resources in my community around fiber production. And that brought me intimately into a relationship with the pasture and the rangeland communities um, in Northern California. And so um, really my organization is now starting to um, focus quite a bit and quite heavily on the relationship between uh, the economics of what derives from a pasture system and the renewable and regenerative capacity uh, through compost applications to increase water holding capacity and to increase soil carbon, we're looking at how we can connect soil carbon or what we call agricultural carbon all the way through the value chain to the end wearer, which is us, those who put clothes on our skin every day. And we're trying to connect and close the loops in the fiber system, starting with the soil all the way to the skin. And so um, let's go to this slide here. Uh, this is a, a map of, uh, you know, a drawn, hand-sketched map um, done by a woman who uh, has worked at the Quivera Conference and done some art for carbon farming. Her name is Joan Pont, and she described our area visually here, mapping out every fiber farmer, uh, rangeland manager, every maker. So makers include people who spin fiber, people who weave it, people who can dye it with natural dyes and people who can cut and sew it. So this is really the value chain that we have now in our region. There are very few mills. Um, those left the landscape quite some time ago um, due to trade policies. But we have many people left on the landscape who are skilled at taking what comes off the rangeland and turning it into clothing. And so um, my organization started out of a one-year commitment that I made to work with this population in my community to actually create a prototype wardrobe from our rangelands to skin, we developed about 23 garments um, that were basically grown and sewn close to home. And so this organization has continued its work and efforts to network farmers and makers. So we take the design community in the urban areas and we cross-pollinate that design community with those who manage our rangelands. And really what we're trying to foster are small businesses that really express the language of the landscape, people who know where they live and care about where they live and create raw materials and finished product from, from our own landscape. Um, so this work, um, as you can probably imagine, includes a lot of public education and skills training. So we see creating um, a fertile culture for fiber sheds includes getting young and old people together. Um, to cross-pollinate uh, on skills, so people who know how to hand spin. Um, we train young people all the way from five years old and up how to spin fiber, how to dye it, how to weave it, how to wear it, how to mend it, how to take care of it. So we also, um, on a broader scale, not only um, at the artisanal scale, we also develop larger fiber system technologies, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And the reason for this is, um, you know, if you look at what you're sitting there and wearing today, um, you looked at the tag um, and uh, you source where the raw material is from for the clothes that you're wearing, most of us would find that there is a huge amount of synthetic material, meaning it's fossil fuel derived. Um, so this, the focus of our education today is really on the effects that we all are experiencing to some degree, um, some of us more than others, around climate change. And we know that you know, fossil fuel use and the burning of fossil fuels is um, the core of this issue. Too much carbon in the wrong place. And one of the places that I would argue that there is too much carbon is on our skin um, in terms of fossil fuel carbon. Um, fossil fuel derived carbon um, is processed into polyesters, nylon, um, different stretch materials, <laughs> so basically we wear plastic. And by 2020, we should expect, um, according to current trends, that 80% of the population 
our global population will be dependent on 80 to 90 percent of their garment budget coming um, from fossil fuel derived fibers. And no one's done an, a correlation between the impact of this tan tangential move towards synthetics and our climate. Um, so we're also looking at, you know, here on this graph, you can, or this pie chart, you can see that uh, wool is a very, very small <clears throat> portion of this um, supply of fiber. And a lot of that has to do with access to wool, um, as you'll see in a further description here. And I just wanted to also talk about some of the unintended consequences of synthetic fibers. It's not just the relationship between burning fossil fuels and creating fiber that you see in the last pie chart, synthetics. It's also once we get those fibers on our skin and they become part of our lifestyle and we wash them and we clean them, um, per washing approximately 1,900 microfibers, uh, plastic microfibers, become lint. And these go, these, uh, pla this plastic lint goes unabated into water ways. And so uh, the latest research by Environment and Technology out of the UK um, decided to look at 18 beaches across the world and, and try to determine what the lion's share of microfibers, you know, where the, where the um, point source for all of these micro plastic microfibers was coming from. And they realized it was actually our synthetic garments um, and the lint that was coming from those synthetic garments. And of course, this is phthalates and other dioxins that get into the food web, which basically is, you know, endocrine disrupting agents that contaminate our food supply and um, our biosphere. So, um, you know, back to back to home. Um, this is part of the reason why I was so compelled to work with our, my local community and rangeland management community specifically um, to build a network. And so, here's an example of an urban designer um, who is holding the shirt on the right that she knit from the sheep that the woman on the left is holding. So this is an heirloom variety Jacob sheep. Um, this woman, has Robin Line, the rangeland manager, she has a very small operation. Um, she has around 65 head and only about 20 acres. But she's an example of our just Greater Bay Area farming community. The, the land is often divided into small homesteads, um, but together they make quite a network of rangeland managers. So here's an example of a shirt that was produced from a relationship between an urbanite and um, someone in the rural community. Um, and then education, we make sure that we bring sheep to schools. Um, we're doing this this year, we've done it two years in a row. We bring um, livestock to schools, and we run a program called Why Not a Weed Eater? And we talk about fossil fuel energy use in land management, and we talk about biosphere-based energy in land management. And we talk about the relationship that we can have to those that help us manage our land, aka sheep in this case, and how those sheep not only mow down the soccer field, um, but that they also produce wool that, the, that we can then utilize for wearing to create clothing. And those of us who eat lamb, we also have a source of meat uh, and protein. And so we talk to children about land management, and we also talk with them about the idea that you eat carbohydrates and proteins and you wear carbohydrates and proteins. And so we talk about where this carbon and carbohydrate comes from, and we talk about how it comes from the sky. And we talk about how grass is created within a very short period of time, turning carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate. And then the sheep eat it and they create proteins and they create protein fibers. You could eat a sheep or you could wear a sheep. Um, but basically you're working with proteins that come from the transmission of carbohydrate nutrients. And children love this value chain and um, they really take to the story and the narrative. Um, and then in the just another aspect of our work, which has actually taken um, us, you know, into a lot of depth in the last 18 months, is looking at the economic feasibility of California's um, rangeland management practices as it relates to wearing clothing. And one of the things we were told was that you'll never be able to use the wool raised in California for anything but, you know, compost or bedding. And I'm not opposed to compost at all, and I'm not opposed to bedding. But I, I, I thought that there at least should be an investigation to understand what the quality of the wool was prior to making an assumption about what it was useful for. 
So we spent six months um, just going out onto the landscape, and we took a sample size of 46% of all the wool produced in California, which is 3.1 million pounds. And we did micron analysis with the USDA, and they, it was the first qualitative study ever done for an entire state um, on wool. And what we found is that actually a uh, majority of our wool, if you, this graph shows you the dark circles, um, anything very dark is a sign of a very high quality wool, which is a low micron count. And then the size of the circle um, denotes the size of that block. So um, you can see we have actually um, quite a few large flocks, and we actually have quite a few high quality wool production, high quality wool production coming from large flocks in California. And so when we mapped it, um, here we go. So if you look at the biggest bar on this bar graph, 22 to 24 micron wool is the majority of the wool that we produce in our state. No one had mapped this prior, and what we realized is that this is quite wearable. Um, in fact, it would make a beautiful sweater, and it would replace the fleece plastic jackets that a lot of us wear. Um, so it's, it's basically an outerwear layer that we found that we could create quite a bit of given that our wool right now is either being sold to China in a commodity market or it's being landfilled or stored in barn rafters. So we have a major underutilization and then the wool that is being utilized is being sold at a price that is not covering the costs of shearing the animal. So basically, wool is being surmised by most of the rangeland managers that I speak with as a byproduct. Very few have a value chain that they can enter into that they feel confident will pay for the cost of shearing. So we're trying to change that narrative, and that means economic assessment feasibility, and that's why we started with a supply analysis. And then from there, we, we drew out a roadmap for a wool mill in California that would have the capacity to actually process all of the wool, which is still, on global terms, considered a boutique mill. 3.1 million pounds of wool processed is considered small. And we built out this mill with solar energy, geothermal, solar thermal, and we also built in a living machine system that would digest the biosolids from the sinuate and all of the other vegetative matter and um, so, you know, I'm guessing there's also some manure left in the wool, even though it's skirted. So we have this process of washing the wool and then having everything that comes off of that wool that's not usable be digested in biofiltration. And before it goes through the biofiltration, we take out the major solids, the, the really thick sludge, and we compost it. And we talked with Dr. Jeff Creek, um, who you just heard speak, about how we could compost these biosolids with other um, green materials coming off of the surrounding mill site and create really great compost that then we would put back out on the rangeland. Uh, so we were trying to close loops um, with full water recycling, full renewable energy, and full waste management that would tie into the compost protocol. And so here's just a very iconic example of what we were looking at doing. The idea is that Everything starts with compost. Everything starts with the soil in the bottom. So I'll just use my green arrow here. Um, all of everything starts and ends here. And so you apply the pasture to the farmland. And here, as we now know, we have an amaz amazing opportunity to uh, reverse global warming if we were to, at scale, apply compost on our rangelands. This is the numbers crack up to being um, well, very, very hopeful, actually. I will use the word hopeful. And so we at Fibershed are very, we feel very um, intrigued and compelled to work with this compost protocol. So all of the wool suppliers to our, um, that would supply wool to our mill, we are going to work with them directly to make sure that they are putting compost on their landscapes. That would be something that we would try to find financial incentives, um, hopefully through the NRCS, to help our growers work to do this. Once they've done that, they basically have carbon beneficial wool. They have wool that comes with a carbon credit. We've also looked at how to scale natural dye processes, and we're doing a study on that right now. So if we have natural fiber dyed naturally, processed in a renewable energy-powered system, and then 
this is all within, you know, about 200 miles. So the whole system has been mapped for even, you'll see, we've, we've taken a carbon accounting of even the commute hours for people coming to this mill. <laughs> but we've tried to close the loop on every level possible. Um, so value-added cloth, basically performance where cloth comes out of this mill, it's cut and sewn, and it's made into finished garments. And at the end of their lifespan, these garments are then recycled and well, they turn back into basic core nutrients. This is carbon that comes back into um, the compost protocol program. And then this process starts over again. And so we took this model and we looked at what it would be like if we were to account for the carbon footprint of this garment, knowing that we were doing all of this on the front end here on the rangeland. And so we looked at the science. Um, and this is just an image that the Marine Carbon Project um, had that shows, you know, where you apply compost. This is where cows like to go <laughs> because there's more forage there. So we we took this compost protocol science and we used Dr. Marcia Delange, who is the scientist who did the life cycle assessment on the compost. And what she did is she mapped. Um, from a life cycle perspective on carbon, what it would be like to map all of these processes and their related emissions and how they, um, emissions and sequestration and how it and at the end of the day works. This would be the first time in our history as a global population that we've ever mapped carbon from the soil to the skin. Current life cycle assessment for garments pretty much starts here. So this is where we're mapping carbon now. If you look at anyone mapping life, you know, the, the footprint of a garment, they're starting here. Very few people track back through the agricultural process. In fact, we're the first ones. So when Marcia did this work, um, and you'll have more time to look at this slide in the, these descriptions here, um, one through seven are going to be something you can investigate in more depth. But what we are looking at is that if we use the compost protocol and we, we take the numbers that Jeff outlined at approximately um, sequestration levels of one ton per hectare, and we chart that through a supply chain that's this, solar-derived energy, an optimistic compost credit, good land management increases, um, soil carbon sequestration at a fairly optimistic rate, which is the, um, the rate of 30 years sequestration, one ton per hectare per year, um, and then minor reductions in the carbon footprint relative to other cases. Um, so basically, we tried to get everyone who worked at the mill living locally, we mapped it for hiring local people, keeping a local community alive economically. And the more you focus on regional economic um, pieces, like hiring locals and training locals and making sure people live near where they work, um, that actually brings the footprint down a lot of this. So we looked at how this whole value chain adds up and really what we start to realize is that we can sequester carbon um, at 37.3 kilograms um, per garment. So if you look at conventional wool production here, this is like your smart wool t-shirt or your Ibex base layer they're emitting 33 kilograms per garment. So if you look at the whole net carbon benefit of doing it in the way that we've roadmapped with the compost protocol, we're basically per year, if we look at the average American that purchases, you won't believe it, but 70 garments per year, if we were in California alone to just offset and start supplying um, this type of garment, a sequestration-based garment, to the average Californian, every year we would sequester 126 million tons, metric tons of CO2. And so this is the equivalent of powering half of California's residential, um, half of California's residences on grid energy. So the footprint, so again, that's 100, around 126 million metric tons based on the average consumption practices of a Californian. And if we were to supplant what they are wearing now with what we could offer them, we have major carbon reductions. And then what I like about this is that we also have compost on our rangelands. We're seeing increased forage, increased water holding capacity, 
um, more local economic activity, and people supporting, um, directly able to support through their consumer purchases, rangeland managers. So this is the vision, and um, we hope to be implementing as, as soon as we can. But this is um, the roadmap that we've created to basically map soil to skin in the most regenerative way we can. And I will leave it with that. Thank you, everyone.